Work and life is extremely close connected. That's why I keep talking about life like art as opposed to art like art. I'm a German washout, so when I was born, I was born in an air riot uh, shelter. You know, you cannot imagine the collective mental state in Germany at the time. So my early days I spent in a war-torn, post-war kind of an environment. So my father was drafted at the age of 20, 21, the First World War. The whole issue on war was absolute taboo to be talking about in my family. My family were three people. That was me, my father, and my mother. From my age 14, I was half orphan. And then eventually, my mother withdrew into the Eiffel Mountains. And uh, I was left on my own. No sisters, no brothers, no... Uh, aunties. Uh, I never met with grandparents. I never I even don't know their name, still don't know their name. From the age of 18, 19, 20, I took my life in my own hand. Whether I did the right thing or the wrong thing, but eventually at the age of 25, I made a big break, changed completely my life. Went to the Netherlands, joined the provost there, the provost it comes from provocation. The provosts were constructive anarchists, very sympathetic to my doings. So that took an incredible turn to my life and eventually it led me in direction art because I thought with media considerable for art and art as such uh, needs a renewal, then it needs a revolution. And I do believe that from early on I have, I am a I like to revolt. I was flirting with the Polaroid camera because I was familiar with analog photography, of course. But the Polaroid camera, you didn't need anything. No dark room, no this, no this. Crucial was that the moment, the very intention of taking a photograph has nothing to do anymore with printing. It's a complete, as a time lapse, two very different intentions. So Polaroid put it all together. So there was the camera, there was the film, there was the dark room, everything in the camera, and I found this. Amazing. The other thing about Polaroid is that I also engaged, except making for five years, self-portraits. I call them auto-Polaroids. I engaged other people. They came to me or I looked for them, marginals, like uh, homeless, drug addicts, uh, mental, mental deranged, uh, transvestites, transsexuals, etc., etc. I always would give the first photograph to the other. So you bridge the relation between the photographer and the model, the photographed. I call it gift exchange. Once you have done this, people are much more approachable and available to collaborate. That, that's another magic about Polaroid. So I start putting the Polaroid photographs in the typewriter. So you had image and text, which is a very powerful thing. But for me, it was again a sort of a split division in my mind and my emotions. So where you give preference to, to writing text or to the image. And at one stage, something in me, a voice in me, told me, no, you are the guy who's going more for image because image is emotional, text is rational, intellectual. 
And I'm not exactly the intellectual person. Transvestite and meeting with these people and gathering with these people. Part of my identity search was that uh, at one stage I developed or a voice in me which came from my anima as opposed to animals. And I had this incredible flirt with my anima and making a woman out of myself. And I found myself reflected more amongst the marginals than in society in general. But uh, Yes, I was with them, for them, and I identified with these people more than anything else. But I was living at the time in Amsterdam at the Herengracht, very close to Rembrandt Square. And there was a street called Utrecht Street. And there was a bar on the corner. And there were transvestites meeting and transsexuals. So I went there, we met there, and I was mostly with the transvestites together. About all of them were walking up Rembrandt Square and up and down Utrecht Street. Uh, there were hookers. I was not a hooker. So when they were pacing up and down and try to get in the car and, I don't know, suck somebody's cock or whatever, then uh, I would remain for some time longer in the bar or would go home. But from there I could have insight into their lives. But after having been taking so long Polaroid photographs, many self-portraits uh, in, uh, in this guy's gender crossing as a transvestite and so on and so on. So, then I came, it's all very important, then I came to the conclusion that photography only can stay on the periphery of things. And then I thought, well, if I look for my genetics or my genetic code or my identity, then I have to go under my skin. So I start cutting, piercing, tattooing, transplantations, and things like this. I performed in front of a camera without audience. So basically, they are performative photography. I made first a stamp reading uh, generation ultimation. I asked a tattooist in Amsterdam to tattoo it exactly the way I spelled it and accentuated. To tattoo it on my left uh, lower arm, and which was done. And when it was tattooed, I was I did it for transplantation from the beginning. I didn't want to keep the tattoo at all. And then I found a plastic surgeon in Amsterdam, but he worked in a hospital in Harlem. So I found the surgeon and he found it a very strange idea. So why you tattoo the thing? I think, well, for the idea to cut it out. And then he agreed and he said, okay, let the tattoo heal. After four weeks, you come back. Then you come to the hospital in Harlem and uh, I will cut it out for you. And then I said, yeah, but it's not just, I want to take Polaroid photographs while you're operating. And he said, okay, that's your business. And I said, well, 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 but I need an assistant, maybe another nurse who is helping me to pull out the images. And he said, okay, I can find somebody for you to do this. And uh, then he started operating and I was taking photographs over my shoulder from it. And the nurse was pulling the things out and pulling the things out. And then during the operation, the surgeon said, what a pity, why don't you take color photographs? They were black and white, you know. But it looked horrific, because the tattoo was deep and you had to cut all three layers of skin. And when you take all three layers of skin, then the meat pops up like this high, maybe five millimeter, and that looks really awful. And then he, he just peeled a very thin top layer from my underarm here and put it here and stitched it all around and put a com big compressor on it, compression. And he said, well, from here on, you know, you come back in a week or two, I shake one more time, but that's it. That's why here it doesn't grow hair, because it comes from here. 
So that was it. And that was incredible fulfillment, but it was another radical, self-radical kind of a thing, but I wanted to make things right. There was one thought behind it. And there's a German expression that is, uh, you bring your skin to the market. That means you sell yourself. And actually, in the back of my head, I never made a big fuss about it. But it actually was <coughs> to, to bring my skin to the art market. Uh, that was a very wild period in a very particular emotional state. But it didn't deliver the answer either. So at one stage, after having been working for four or five years with auto-polaroids and self-portraits, etc., etc., I came to the conclusion there's only one other medium which can do the job, performance. But when I first read the word performance, my interpretation was perforation. And I liked that because I wanted to inject lifelike art, life, into the white cube galleries and into the museums. It needed life. This is all representational painting, etc. Great history, of course, wonderful, beautiful works. But they need a living, the living. So I did an event in 1976 in the Apple in Amsterdam called Photo Toad. So I had nine large black and white photographic images over three walls. The fourth wall was a balcony on which I, first I prepared the images. They were about 100 by 70 centimeters, three and three and three. I was hanging them before the opening. I was hanging them above head high of the audience. And there were installed strong halogen lights, but they were not on. For the audience who entered the space, I want them to have some kind of uh, haptic or, or uh, optic orientation to find themselves in the space. I put a, a yellow-green light, which is used in dark rooms for printing, black and white. When the audience was in, somebody closed the door and we shot, on, we shot the, the halogen lights on, the typical gallery lights for artworks on white walls. And within about 15 seconds, the images, black and white images, recognizable images of a person in landscape, the images disappear to black surfaces. So the question is where the image goes. But the people coming to look at artworks they try to figure out what is the meaning of the artwork, what is it doing, emotionally, psychologically, critical, whatever. Any art recipient has a different attitude. But then I came to the first step into performance, uh, for which I, I was invited to a gallery in Wuppertal that was a white cube gallery, but I didn't want to do performance in the white cube gallery. So I chose a garage space outside the white cube gallery. There was still a truck parked, it was ugly, it's, the, the smell was oily. And I, uh, cut, I cut a mirror about in the shape of my body, height and width and talia and so, or waist. And in front of me was another glass plate, also about two meters by 60 centimeters. Uh, there was a strong light on the audience. There were more. There were maybe in the mean about 50 people. And while the audience was reflected in the mirror, in my body mirror or mirrored body, um, I would move slightly to the left, to the right, 
and the audience was very insecure because if you look in the mirror and the mirror is moving and makes you very uncomfortable. Okay, that's what I wanted. But at the time, the audience was really dragged to their image, their own images. I kept it up maybe for five or ten minutes. And then at one stage, I let myself fall uh, to the front. And then the audience literally became sandwiched and shuttered between the two mirrors. That was the idea, because I didn't like art audience at the time. I have reasons for that. And then in Berlin, I strolled around, and amongst other things, I went to the new National Gallery, which is still my favorite building, a Miss van der Rohe building. And of course, the new National Gallery showed modernist works of art, mostly painting and sculpture. But in the basement was a completely different exhibition that was German Romantic Biedermeier, 18th century, 19th century. And there was a painting called The Poor Poet by Karl Spitzweg. And I got very excited about it because somehow during my German part of education, I was confronted with the same painting. It was in my reading, first reading book, color printed, the only color print in my reading book. And I know my father favorite, everybody in Germany favorite. And actually, I depicted that this particular painting, you could say, was a German identity icon. Aside, it was Hitler's favorite painting. To break away from what I have done before for a new chapter, to enter something new, but also to give a really strong signal of what I am about as an artist at the time, 76, I decided to steal the painting. I studied the situation for about one week. And all I could do and wanted to do is get this painting, steal it, run out of the museum with my hands and feet. I had no technical or assistance for doing this. So I stole this painting and I managed to get out, just about to get out of the museum. My black, ugly, Citroen H white truck was ready to jump in the truck, run away, the guards, they were on my heels. So I drove in Berlin Kreuzberg, just about two and a half, three and a half kilometers, then I left the car, grabbed the painting under my arm, run away in snow and ugliness. Berlin Kreuzberg at the, way, at the time was really a ghetto where Turkish foreign workers were situated. Turkish foreign workers were really discriminated. There were, the Turks came to, to do the dirty work in Germany, like Italians and the Greeks at the time. Uh, and I found that not acceptable. Before the action, I looked for a Turkish family who was willing to allow me to enter for documentary film reason. I didn't tell them about the, the theft. And eventually I found, I tried three or four, and eventually I found one family, this particular house on the fourth floor. And they said, okay, you can come. There was a telephone booth in front, and I called the police. Zum Künstlerhaus Bethanien, es ist in Kreuzberg. Da ist das Bild, da können Sie es auch lassen. Und bitte, ich kann meinen Namen nicht nennen. Ich werde aber wahrscheinlich da sein. Und würden Sie bitte so freundlich sein, weil ich so freundlich war. Und ich said, well, I'm the one who had stolen just an hour or two ago. I have stolen the painting, Karl Spitzweg's painting, 
from the new National Gallery. And I want that Professor Honisch, he was at the time the director of the new National Gallery. I want him to come to Berlin Kreuzberg there and there. And I show him the painting and I want him to certify me that I did not damage or destroy the painting. That was, it would have gone completely in the wrong direction if I would have destroyed it. And uh, that was it. And then they asked me for my name. And so I said, I cannot mention my name. Then I put the, the phone back on the, the automat. And then I went into the house. hang the painting on the wall of the Turkish family for the reason to bring this whole issue about Turkish discriminated foreign workers into discussion, to bring into discussion the institutionalization of art, to bring discussion about uh, the correspondence between art institutes from the academy to museums, to whatever, you know. So actually it was a tremendous irritation to steer up a discussion about. I was standing in front of the, the house to aspect either the police or the director, smoking one cigarette after the other, and it took about one hour before the director came. But in the meanwhile, there was a huge convoy of anti-terror police brigades and they sealed the whole block systematically. And when that was done, uh, a great Mercedes Benz came. We got the painting back, I took all the consequences. We found each other under unusual circumstances in Amsterdam in 1975, uh, where Marina did a performance for Dutch television. And the performance was Thomas Lips. She drew a pentagonal star uh, around the postcard of Thomas Lips. And she took the razor plate and cut it herself in the stomach, the pentagonal star. And then she went on her knees and started whipping herself violently. Bleeding like hell, whipping herself. Uh, I was shocked because there was some kind of witchcraft involved. She withdrew there and tried to get out of her thing, performance. And then I came there and uh, I got some iodium something, disinfection stuff and some cotton things, and try to nurse her wound. And that was actually the first touch. excellent solo performer. I did all this self-investigation, identity research, being transvestite and things like this. She wanted to see the Polaroids and I showed to her and she was completely fascinated about it. That was another coming closer together. And then we met, I think we were two days in my place in Amsterdam. Then she had to go back to Belgrade. I remained in Amsterdam, and then we said, okay, we check us again whether we could be a couple or even working together. So we decided to meet in Prague again two weeks later. She came from, that's a geographic middle between Belgrade and Amsterdam. 
So we met in Prague, we lodged at a Pari the Hotel Paris for a week. Of course, that was final. So she came to Amsterdam, we were there together, and then, of course, the crucial thing came. There are two autonomous single artists. How can we possibly put the two forces to one? For two egocentric driven artists, it's not easy to join forces, to create one and the same work together and authorize the work as one. And that was a difficulty, actually. So eventually, we came to a formula and we started working together. I think the first performance we did together was in for the Venice Biennale in 1976, in June 1976. Since performance was not really welcome in the conventional art context, uh, performance here and there, means Europe and the United States, they are activated, awakened alternative spaces. And uh, of course the alternative spaces had mostly, uh, were mostly fitting more in the idea about anti-aesthetics and were not dominated by the art market. And that was good but I think it was accepted due to the, the strength and the power of our uh, collaborative performances. You know, at one stage, I think it was in 76 already, we decided to be permanent in movement. It was also in, inherent or enforced by our existential means or no existential means. So we decided, okay, we do performance. We do performance in Bologna, for example. We will get 150 D mark. That's about just covering the petrol. Uh, so what we went into, the relation works. Relation works means there's a man and a woman and they're demonstrated partly violently or self-mutilating uh, self uh, traumatic fears of relation at all. Uh, later on, Abramovich and me were collabor collaborative working and many people experience it all as demonstrating pain, by name physical pain. Bullshit. Nothing to do with physical pain. But I think mentally or psychologically we had the urge to express, now to use concepts for performing, either in front of the camera or for an audience, which would be very uncomfortable, for the onlooker very uncomfortable but it never had anything to do with pain. Also, you know, <laughs> we did another piece together, like uh, talking about similarity. That was for our first birthday together. We invited guests and friends for the birthday. And we did this piece about uh, talking about similarity. For the piece, I decided, I decided to stitch my mouth with needle and thread. The idea was that I shut my mouth closed by sewing it up. And at one stage I would leave the place and Marina would take my place. And the audience could discharge their emotions, their, their, their threat, their anger to Marina. 
and Marina was supposed to talk for me in I person. I decided to shut my mouth. I decided to stitch my mouth. And I did this and this and this. Till she made a mistake, talking for herself. Say, he. That was the end of it. The moment we agreed to work together, we went totally in one direction. <coughs> With all economical consequences. So we decided to get a van, a truck. I decided to paint it mud black. And we had a, from that moment on, we had no address anymore. So we lived in this van. And from the moment we lived in this van, we decided, we made a manifesto. <clears throat> and I believe it was art vital. No fixed living place, permanent, mobile or emotion, local contact, uh, no rehearsal, no repetition, no predicted ending, etc., etc. And from there we derived living in a truck, I think, for three years or longer. And uh, it was beautiful, it was beautiful. We also involved the truck, our truck, our home, mobile home, sometimes in performances. And I, I do believe, to my, to my likes, if I may say so, it was the most beautiful time together. And that lasted, I think, from 1976 to maybe 80, 79, 80. So we became more continental, globally operating with performances, or Japan, or Australia. It's my personal opinion. The period from 1976 to 80 was the most crucial. After we changed actually everything what Art Weitzel had promised, <coughs> there became uh, the cycle of Nazi Crossing performances, which was uh, 90 non-consecutive days, sitting on a table opposite each other, uh, very trivial setup actually. There were tableau vivants. We were totally motionless, silent, fasting. Sometimes for one day, sometimes for four days, sometimes for 16 days. And I think it lasted from 1981 to 1987. Non consecutive. And they were repeated. 1986 on, we start negotiating heavily with the Chinese authorities to get a permission to walk the whole Great Wall of China. That was a hustle, tremendous hustle. But, um, you know, there are two periods in our life, actually. I mean, in our collaborative life, 1976, 1980, 1981 to 88. I would say 80. Six, seven, because the walk, the Great Wall walk, I see not as a performance at all. It was just an epic on top of what we have done to separate. That's it. After the, uh, the ending of the collaboration, which was uh, created really a vacuum, a small death, because the collaboration was so intensive, uh, the whole relation, collaboration, work was uh, reached a, uh, how should I say, a symbiotic quality, quality if you wish. Uh, Symbiotic relations are not very favorable because it makes you biologically totally dependent. And symbiosis can uh, play tricks on you, which you don't expect. Um, I had a break. 
I broke, I had a break and broke. And uh, I think I got on booze and drugs for some time. Like actually booze and cocaine. So I withdrew, I laid back and I withdrew and said, well, how possibly go on? And then of course, the cradle of my artistic work is, was photography prior to performance. I mean, at the time, the history of photography was about 160 years. And photography was not really accepted or very late accepted being contemporary art. So photography, perhaps, was the most contemporary of art at all. Later on video, of course. But um, I thought there are still things which were not explored in the history of analog photography. Then I got into something called uh, retina, negative retinal after images, or in psychology they also call photogenes. When you see a light source, a bright light source, like this one, and you close your eyes, it turns negative. You see, rather than the bright white spot, you see shortly a black spot. And the, the negative retinal after images are inherent to our visual perception. And I thought, well, it was never done in analog photography, in the whole history of analog photography, that you simulate as something you cannot photograph, you only can simulate, that you simulate this negative retinal after images. I walked for two years in Berlin, mainly Berlin Mitte, East, and you saw all these Prussian imperial buildings, which were heavy, heavy, uh, shot, sheltered, bombed by Russian. The result was that many of these imperial, neo-imperial imperial buildings were improvised, uh, repaired, restored. They used stone implantations, they used uh, the wrong color and wrong material uh, to fix the holes and stuff like this. And I said, wow. I like to apply Berlin's history and I like to apply what never was simulated, the, the negative retinal after images with two cameras, my Leica and my Blauwell Magina. But I printed them in negative. And when you print these images, color images in ne color negative, you see much more uh, the wounds of the city as they were in these imperial buildings. That's what I did. I did a whole series, only architecture, which was called the skin of the city. And then I went one step further. Then I produced the 15 national European member state flags I produced in color reverse colors. And then I had somebody assisting me and dragging the flags in front of these buildings. The buildings, all the environment, the backdrops were negative, but the flags turned positive. Also because Berlin at the time became the European capital, from Bonn to Berlin. And Berlin was already in the center point focus of then the European Union of becoming a dominating place. Most of my audiences are young people. And that is for me the biggest compliment. Because 
if there's one thing I do appreciate most is that I eventually am still being able to do this, that I can uh, further communicate, either oral or otherwise, to communicate my life experience, and there is, since 50 years, you cannot separate my life from art, that I can communicate and pass on the red thread of my life alias art or art alias life experience. That's the biggest compliment. I decided to become an artist out of discontent. I was in discontent with myself. I was in discontent with society. And I was in discontent with art. My brutality is being so stubborn and stick to my principles and philosophy. And I'm still like myself, even in today's world, which is unfortunately dominated. Uh, by our market. I still like to be naughty and not fitting. So this tiny little envelope is uh, one of my most favorite treasures. The name is emulsion, 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 referring to as well to skin as to the emulsion of a photographic image. And the subtitle is the second skin. You see, it's extremely fragile. I took a Polaroid photograph of my face the, at the time or the moment that I peeled a layer of skin off my face. Yeah. Now here's the thing, and that's the fragile part. Then next, from the Polaroid photograph, I peeled the emotion. That means I peel my skin, emulsion, then I peel from the photograph, the Polaroid photograph, the emulsion. And the whole thing is so thin and so vulnerable. And this is one of my most, uh, my most treasured, also because of the vulnerability, one of my most treasured uh, images, at least from the Polaroid period.